So I've been at this for 30 years. I would say there's just one topic that divides cat people, and that would be declawing. Declawing cats has been a very hot topic for a long time, and it's getting hotter. If you've declawed your cat before, I'm not here to make you feel like a terrible person. I'm here to hopefully give you the facts and let you make an educated decision. And that's what this is all about. I am fiercely anti-declaw. I have been educating about the uh, terrible nature of this elective surgery for since the early 90s, really. Hopefully, when I lay this out, even if you have declawed your cat in the past, I get that. But hopefully from this point on, you won't. What is declawing? Well, it's a practice that started to become really popular in about the 1950s. More folks were moving from rural places to urban places or even suburban places where cats were just spending a lot more time inside. We just saw that furniture paid the price. Lots of scratched up couches and beds. The solution at the time was what the veterinary industry calls oniectomy, oniectomy. Spelled right here because I always have problems pronouncing it. Onychectomy. It, the translation is nail removal. And that's the, the bill of goods that was sold to the American uh, cat guardian public for many, many years. How prevalent is it? Even today, the estimates are between 20 and 25% of all cats in American homes are still declawed. Why is that a problem? Okay. Let's start getting into that. When I talk about decline being a bill of goods that was sold to people who had cats, well, the name says it all, taking the nail out. That's just not true. You're not removing the claw. What instead is being done in order to get the claw, you have to remove that toe at the first digit. We are removing the first digit of every toe on a cat's paw. I mean, let's face it, we're not declawing, we're de-knuckling. Unfortunately, all the cats that I know that were declawed had some issue or another. As a matter of fact, I can tell a declawed cat walking across the room from 10 paces. Cats are what we call digitigrade, which means they're tiptoe walkers. You see your cat walking around on their tiptoes. The second you perform this surgery, they go flat-footed immediately. You're throwing off their balance. You're throwing off the way that weight is distributed. I've seen later on in life, we have arthritis that is much more likely. We see it in the toes, the wrists, the shoulders. I've also seen a lot of what we would call botch jobs where the declaw wasn't done cleanly and there are bone fragments within that, that nail bed and, and in the toes. So it's that pebble in the shoe syndrome. Folks would do this proactively because they said it would stop their cat from scratching them or scratching their children, their small children, which is a very common reason why uh, people declaw their cats. A cat who doesn't have their claws will be that much more likely to bite. Why is that? Well, in normal cat behavior, they're, they're not offensive animals by nature. They're defensive. So if a cat feels threatened, the first thing they're gonna do is hold up their paw and make sounds. Then they're going to bat. Then they're going to actually have nails out and scratch because they feel really threatened. And then finally, if none of that is working, they bite. So if all this is taken away, they're going to bite first and ask questions later. And that unfortunately led to a lot of cats being surrendered to shelters because they declawed the cat because they thought they would protect their children against cat scratches. Now they're getting bit and now they're relinquishing to a shelter. Well, you thought you had a problem with your cat scratching your furniture. Now your cat's peeing everywhere. Your cat starts to use the litter box after the surgery and their paws are really tender and they could scratch in the litter, get litter inside that little hole if it's not, if it's not healed up all the way. And so now they go into a litter box and they go, wait a minute, this place suddenly really hurts. Carpet doesn't hurt. 
your bed doesn't hurt, your couch doesn't hurt, that's where I'm gonna go. The other thing that I've seen is phantom pain. So if you're a human and you have a limb amputated, the thing that we hear very commonly from, uh, from amputees, their nerves will often just tell them that that limb is still there and it really hurts. My position is that cats feel phantom pain and we get that from uh, gnawing at their paws. I see that one a lot where it's just, just gnawing at their paws or a constant shaking of the paws. Even if the paw has healed up, the trauma has not healed up. The cool thing, if there is a cool thing to this, is over the last 15, 20 years max, now we're seeing studies that are coming out. So let me just pull out a few of those facts. In 1998, Jankowski writes uh, that acute complications, quote, develop in up to one half of declawed cats. Long-term complications of the procedure are reported for about one-fifth or 20% of onychectomized cats. That's enough. 20% in veterinary medicine reported 11% lameness, 17% wound breakdown, and 10% nail regrowth post-operatively in cats having declaw surgery. Now we're at 2001. Again, in the Journal of the AVMA, found that 33% of cats suffer at least one behavioral problem after declaw or tendinectomy surgery. Tendinectomy is just as nasty. The tendon that allows for the claw to extend and retract again uh, is clipped. So that means they can't use it. What that also means is that the nail then starts dragging on carpet. You constantly have to trim those nails because they're gonna get caught on things and rip it out. The study shows that 17.9% of cats had an increase in biting frequency or intensity and that 15.4% would not use a litter box. Researchers Morgan and Haupt found that the 24 declawed cats in their internet survey had a 40% higher incidence of house soiling than non-declawed cats. And then uh, other researchers, uh, Borschelt and Voith, said that looking only at aggressive behavior in a retrospective surgery of pet owners, they found that declawed cats bit family members more often than did non-declawed cats. In a retrospective phone survey, Patronac uh, found that among 218 cats relinquished to a shelter 52.4% of declawed cats versus 29% of non-declawed cats were reported to have inappropriate elimination. So I don't wanna go into all the studies I've got in front of me right now that we've been collecting throughout the years. Um, I will provide links to some of them uh, in the description so that you can uh, educate yourselves. One that I really would love to bring up, because it's recent, so this is coming from somebody who was a shelter worker for many years and still works with shelters and rescues around the country and actually around the world. The common wisdom was, if you don't declaw the cat, if you just say, oh, no, no, this is wrong and don't do it, well, then you're gonna wind up surrendering that cat to the shelter. And of course, this cat, who's a serial scratcher or aggressive or whatever, that cat will then stand a much better chance of being euthanized because they can't get adopted because they scratch. So that, again, was an argument that allowed the practice to perpetuate without any sort of ramification. So this was a study that, uh, a peer-reviewed study from uh, the British Columbia SPCA. Uh, so this is great. The uh, College of Veterinarians of British Columbia uh, announced a ban on feline declawing in 2018. Yay, British Columbia. Well, the, the BC SPCA um, wanted to perform a formal peer-reviewed analysis. The team analyzed six years of data including three years before and after the ban, representing the majority of animal shelters in the province of BC. After analyzing records from 74,587 cats, they found there was no significant difference in surrender for destructive scratching, and overall, it's a rare reason for people to give up cats, only 50 cats over six years. There was a decrease in the number of cats entering the shelter and a decrease in cat euthanasia, and cats spent less time in the shelter waiting to be adopted after the ban as opposed to before. I can't tell you how significant this landmark study is.
It is so amazing to see this, to take this out of the world of the anecdotal and into the peer-reviewed world. Anti-declaw geeking out right now. This surgery, this procedure, whatever you want to call it, it has been banned in over 42 countries around the globe, which was unheard of 20 years ago. So now, for instance, California, and this is a long story why this happened, but it, it, it was made impossible to lobby for a statewide ban. So the folks at the PAW Project, and I'm glad to have helped with this, went to city council to city council and got it banned in eight different cities around the state, including West Hollywood, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and more. From there, more and more cities have banned declawing, including just some off the top of my head, Denver, Austin, Madison is the newest one, Pittsburgh, uh, St. Louis. There's a lot of cities that have now banned declawing. Now here's the big news, is that recently the state of New York became the first state uh, to ban declawing. My home state, that's right. And that's amazing, man. Thanks to that landmark decision in New York, now we've got other states that are pushing it through uh, their state legislators. So that includes Massachusetts, Nevada, Rhode Island, Arizona, Connecticut, Florida, and in a nice little twist, California has now reintroduced the statewide ban uh, into committee. Yay! So now we've got declawing being banned all over the place. Countries, cities, states. Why is it not being decried by veterinarians? The American Veterinary Med Medical Association really were very standoffish about it for a very long time because, you know, the vets wanted to do it. They wanted the freedom to do it. In 2014, they revised their position statement to say that declawing should be discouraged, should only be done as a last resort when all other measures have failed in terms of education and behavioral work, etc. In 2020, that position was amended to say that it should be, <laughs> and you would figure it would go in the one direction of banning, and instead it went in the other direction of more confusing language, which was that now it's about the veterinarian's best judgment when it comes to the health of their clients and patients. I, you know, I do not like demonizing in order to get my point across, but I will say this, to you guys. If your vet declaws cats, I think you should find another vet because based on all the things that I've been saying, what, Bramble, help me. Bramble, help me. Tell me what to say, Bramble. Bramble says my vet doesn't declaw. Well, there we go. Thank you, Bramble. Thank you, much appreciated. <laughs> So that's all I gotta say about that. The way we're going to stop the practice is if the demand dries up and if it makes vets who don't declaw look like heroes and vets who do declaw as something else. If you've declawed your cat in the past, okay. If after hearing what I've just said, you're saying, I'll do it again, I guess that's another story and maybe you're watching the wrong channel. I have another message, and that's to people in the camp that want to see this act banned for good, everywhere. Education is everything, but compassionate education is king. Nobody has ever learned anything while somebody has their neck veins popping out and are sweating and spitting while they're trying to make that point. Make no mistake, anger has a place here. This is a barbaric act that needs to go away in a compassionate society. But if we want it to stop, the demand has to dry up. Educate folks who want to declaw, let them know that there's plenty of resources and there might be a lot of things they don't know about the procedure. And try to make sure that People who perform this, the procedure don't get your business. That's that. Are you done yet?
That's what he's saying to me. I'm bored, I wanna play, and I wouldn't mind some dinner also. So that's it. My hope is that if you know somebody who is thinking of declawing their cat, you share this video with them. And um, even if you've got friends who have declawed and wanna do something about it, share it with them too. And speaking of doing something about it, one of the best ways that you can do something about it is to support the PAW Project. They have been behind a lot of the legislation, a lot of the education down through the years, and I will put a link to that organization in the description as well because honestly, amazing people there. They've done a lot of hard work on this. So that's it for me. I, I want to know what your thoughts are. Please keep it civil, but I want to know your thoughts and, and put those down below in the comments. And in the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to this channel because those subscriptions make the channel tick. Be kind to animals, be kind to your animals, be kind to each other, and I'll see you soon. Light, love, mojo. Yeah.